Since germicidal lamps are really popular at the moment for reasons, um, I've ordered quite a few. I've ordered some LED ones that I think are possibly fake, and I ordered this rather neat table mounting one, which uh, is very neat and very real. This, uh, I want to mention right at the beginning, these may look cool, but they do cause eye and skin damage if you look at them. So the idea is that, uh, well, here's the listing for a start. The listing is for a 36 watt, I'm not sure about the wattage rate in here, 36 watt UVC ozone ultraviolet germicidal lamp remote UV sterilisation quartz lights. It cost £35 in the UK with uh, inclusive shipping and it came through quite quickly, but do you know what? It came through with just a piece of polystyrene on either side of the tube and a bag wrap round it and the only damage it's incurred is a plastic clip in the casing seems to have failed. Um, so I'm really surprised the tube survived that. This one comes with a remote control, but I'll show you that there's a slight thing there. So I'm going to turn it on right, and then I'm going to turn it straight off the remote control, because when I turn it on, it immediately powers up. So let's turn it off. So what you do with this, you put it into your room, you turn it on, you immediately turn it back off again. And then from outside the room, you can then turn it on. And I'm going to step, I'm going to step way back here to do this. So you turn it on. And then you can select the time and it blinks off and on again and that's the time select. And now I'm going to turn it back off because I have absolutely no intention of being anywhere near this. Partly because I've discovered that my reading glasses I'm wearing at the moment don't fully block UVC like my glass ones did. And I had itchy eyes recently at night time after playing about with some of these. So take a look at this. Uh, the top of it has a rubber bung that is supposed to... It's designed for a different lamp. It's designed for a lamp with two little uh, sections tube coming out and the bridging section. The sort of, it's a type of base, I believe, called the PLL lamp. And if you look at a picture on the listing for this, very smart. It, it sh actually shows the bung missing completely because it didn't fit, presumably. And the two sections of that style of tube just protruding out the top. It shows lots of squishes and swirls. It doesn't actually rotate. All it does is just beam out ultraviolet. And... Uh, it shows a filter next to it. It's worth noting that the ultraviolet will only sterilise by breaking down DNA, literally. Uh, it'll only sterilise anything that is directly radiated, radiated by the light. And the ozone would actually have to be better actually pulling it through a filter to actually clean it because the ozone is just going to surround it. It's not necessarily going to permeate into the filter very quickly. And it would have better effect if it was actually blown through the filter, which is why some filter systems have ultraviolet tubes built in. It's also worth mentioning you could probably change the tube in this when it wasn't being needed for germicidal purposes for a standard white tube. I'm not sure the wattage rating. And stand by, this thing draws one watt um, with a power factor of 0 0.07, 67 milliamps, which means that if the, you were being charged a power, it would be close to 16 watts or something like that. But uh, for actual power, it's about one watt. And when it's on, it... Uh, dissipates about uh, 31 watts and that means that it's most likely close to a 24 watt tube i'm not sure it seems too short for a 36 watt tube and possibly too long for a 24 watt tube i'm not sure i tried to take the tube out but it is cable tied into the base down there so that means we have to open it up so let's open it up things worthy of note uh yes uvc does kill Viruses, well, it destroys viruses, it damages them, um, and bacteria as well, but it also damages humans. It uh, it damages your skin, gives it, it cuts, doesn't even give you a suntan, it goes straight to sunburn. And if your eyes get exposed to it, you will end up with uh, welder's eye, which is basically speaking, ultraviolet exposure damages the very surface of it. It doesn't penetrate deeply into it, it only seems to act on the surface and it makes the, if you damage your eyes, they'll be very, very sore indeed. You'll wake up in the middle of the night with an extreme pain. Uh, apparently a welder's trick for that is to squeeze potato, grape potato, and get the juice out of it, and then put a drop into the eye. I'm not sure. As someone said recently, how did someone discover that? Did a welder, the only thing I can think of is that you see these uh, people putting cucumber in their eye to cool them or soften the skin or something and they must have been in so much pain they thought anything you know I don't have cucumber I've got potato and so they got the potato and uh, stuck it in their eye and it worked I guess okay right this is very modular right tell you what I'm gonna have to take this apart a bit further just give me a second I'll be back with you in a jiffy and resume so 
very much like these generic Chinese products. It's manufactured in a very modular way. So they've got a separate uh, remote control receiver unit and a separate um, fluorescent driver here. The units were unfortunately just stuck in with double-sided tape. You could see me trying to get it back off my finger there, which means ultimately that means they can swap modules around. And there is another hole in this. Uh, which is covered in this label. The label isn't there for safety, although it's nice that it's there. It says, when the product is working, no people or pets around. Avoid ultraviolet radiation damage, Tuscan and eyes. Um, but that really, the only reason they put that label there really is to cover that hole. Very strange. But it's nice that there is a warning label on it because uh, it can damage your skin and eyes. Don't expose yourself to it. It's a very unpleasant thing. So the remote control unit, let's zoom down in this. I'll show you the circuitry individually and then I'll show you the schematic, a rough schematic of the driver. So we'll take a look at the remote first. Do we go a wee bit closer than that? Let's go a little bit closer at the risk of just nudging quality down. Uh, the relay is rated for about 277 volts at AC at 10 amps. It has a classic dropper in that it's got uh, the incoming supply and the incoming supply is onto these just rather small pads. It's just soldered directly onto them, but, but it's still okay. We've got the brown and blue coming in and we've got the uh, red, two reds going out. There's a bridge rectifier with one end fed directly from one of the incoming supply connections and the other going via a small 470 microhenry uh, inductor and then a... 820 nanofarad capacitor. This is a, well, it's got a fairly high seeming apparent standby current, this capacitor here. There's a tiny little discharge resistor across that there that's grossly undersized. That's probably one of the biggest suspects for feeling. So that drops the, uh, the that limits the current. And then there are zener diodes here, small zeners, uh, which then cap that voltage down to a lower level. And that uh, initially, this is capped down to probably about 24 volts of relay here, and then probably about 12 maybe in this scene, I'd guess, before it goes to this uh, voltage regulator, which was, is probably uh, 7805, 78L05, the look of it. So that's the 5 volt regulator. We've got the ubiquitous 8 pin chip, the little dedicated microcontroller, but it's got a separate receiver unit here, a dedicated module for receiving the radio control signal, which then puts uh, either data out to it. Yeah, it's just only, it's only got three connections. So it's putting data out to that chip. The chip decodes it, and then it's got the timing functions built in, and then it controls via another line over to this little transistor here that then switches the relay on, that then provides power over to the driver. The driver is interesting. Note the discrete bridge rectifiers here. Notice these two capacitors that are the power supply capacitors, but they're actually wired in series with one end going down to the tube, the two connections going out to each end of the tube. Note the big inductor here. This is the main inductor, the choke, the ballast for the tube. Uh, this is a capacitor that will pass current uh, for the to keep the uh, electrodes warm at the end. And then this is the feedback uh, transformer here, the little uh, in Ductor, the little toroid, uh, which has three windings on it. The blue winding is the in series with this, so that as the current flows through the tube, it induces current in the, this little inductor. And then there's a green winding here and a red winding on the other side that each feed to a standard transistor. Um, and there's some support circuitry, and I shall show you the schematic for that. A very rough schematic, not component accurate, um, because I've missed some of the components off for clarity. I'll reverse engineer it later, though. That's quite interesting. So here is the classic circuit. It's really very standard. The one odd thing is I'd normally expect to see another capacitor in series with, with a, a, either in series with the actual, well, in series the tube, basically, somewhere. So here's the incoming supply. We've got the bridge rectifier based on the four diodes. We've got the two capacitors that are 10 microfarad, 250 volts. And the center tap of those capacitors is taken to one end of the tube. The other end of the tube uh, goes to an inductor, uh, and then that little feedback coil that has the three windings. And the transistors are 13003 transistors. It's a very standard transistor used in, it's designed specifically for uh, the high voltage and the high frequency switching of these uh, fluorescent lamp ballasts. The capacitor here, as well as current flowing through the actual gas itself, current uh, bypasses the tube via the capacitor. So these little electrodes here, 
the cathodes, which have to be maintained at a certain temperature to uh, make them emissive and lower the voltage drop, they're always going to see some current going through that. And although 6.8 nanofarads doesn't seem very high when you're used to the quite high volumes of capacitive droppers, in reality, because this tube is operating at very high frequency, this will pass actually quite a bit of current. So some of that current will be going through those filaments to keep them hot, and some of it will be going through the gas in the tube. And that is how that works. Let's zoom out. Let's take a look at the whole thing again. The tube I measured it, uh, it didn't really come into a 24 watt. It was too short for a 36 watt. I'm guessing that ultimately, if you had to replace the tube and you got a 36 watt tube as it's rated, it is going to stick out the top like that because there's just not enough room for it. I don't see anything really obvious holding this in place other than the fact that the tube goes down through a little guide and then sort of holds this. I, I don't think it would be super loose inside. I, I don't know. One, it was cable tied in, so changing this tube is not going to be that easy. It is going to have involve taking the base off, whereupon all the circuit boards will fall out because they're just stuck in with sticky tape. Uh, so that's more or less it. It is a, it's made down to a price. It's usable. It's not serviceable by people, normal people, but it is serviceable by people like us. Um, and it does have the scope to be modified as a base. Once you finish with it for its intended application, you could build an interesting LED or or fluorescent light out of it by changing it. It's worth mentioning that you could theoretically just have the tube sticking up in its own out of this, but it wouldn't have the protection of that rather stylish big ring, which does unfortunately block quite a lot of the light out of it as well from the sides. So a quick recap before I go. The tubes do emit uh, ultraviolet. It's worth mentioning. Oh, look at the blob of mercury. Oh, no, I'm talking shit. I saw the I saw the screw rolling about under it. I thought that was a blob of mercury inside. I'm almost disappointed now. I can see little tiny droplets of mercury. They use the absolute minimum possible these days. But uh, UV tubes emit... Uh, multiple bands. They emit them in the visible wavelength as well as uh, the ultraviolet wavelength, and they emit three wavelengths in the ultraviolet. One is uh, in the sort of UVA spectrum, which makes things fluoresce, but isn't really that harmful to humans. One is in the area that it has that germicidal effect, um, and one is in the area that it's germicidal and ozone generation. It's, it's, low, it's lower than about 200 uh, nanometers when it starts actually splitting the oxygen bonds apart, and that's how it creates ozone in the air. You do get tubes that filter out that uh, the highest wave, the shortest wavelength, which is the one that creates ozone. So you do actually get germicidal tubes that don't create ozone. But to me, I think in this ap application they've used the basic one. This one puts out both those wavelengths, but it puts all, all the wavelengths ultimately, and it puts out all three of the UV. Uh, UV ones, the one that's going to make things in the room glow, but don't be around in the room when you've got this running. And the two that are germicidal and the one of those that is germicidal and does the uh, ozone thing. And I think it's useful to have the ozone because it's worth using one of these as just an ozone generator because it does create copious quantities of ozone. The instructions are great. My favourite bit in the instructions it's, is where it says down here, 92% of the world's population breathe excessive air. So there you go. We're breathing excessive air. I can think of a few people who are breathing excessive air, but I like the way it's got inverted commas there. Um, and it's quite good that this one does actually have information. It specifically does mention special reminder, uh, and it, it's a bit chinglish, but it does uh, warn you about both the ultraviolet and the ozone hazards and recommends ventilating to the room for 40 minutes after you've turned it off. It does have a warranty card. I think that's probably not worth the paper it's written on. So there we go. It's an interesting unit. It looks very stylish. It does the job. But as I've said before, and I'll say again, just in case people get these and don't realise the harm of them, uh, just be careful not to expose yourself to this light. That means no uh, animals, uh, no humans in the room when this is on. Also, if you've got delicate plants, you can take them out as well. Make sure everybody knows that this is dangerous and uh, because it looks so alluring. It's the sort of thing that people would say, oh, it looks like a disco light. They could put it in the middle of the table. Just make sure it's well labelled up and everybody in the family is completely aware that this will cause eye damage and it will cause skin damage if you get exposed to it for any, well, even just literally seconds will cause the, the eye problems. But there we go. 
it's interesting, it's very typical, it's very modular, it's very stylish, and I suppose it does the job even if, when it comes to the crunch, it shouldn't really be in the hands of the general public. But there we go.